Hello everyone, welcome to episode 107 of the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast. I'm your host, Chris Cato. I'm going to be bringing in my co-host, Tyler McDonald, in just a second. And we're going to be recapping today what was a phenomenal 2021 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. But before we get through that, we obviously just get through our sponsors for this episode. And we are very excited to announce a new sponsor to the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast, an excellent company. Support for the Backmarkers F1 Show is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best men's below-the-waist grooming champions of the world. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped just launched their fourth-generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. That's right, the 4.0. For over, you can join over two million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with the exclusive offer just for you guys, Backmarkers F1 Show subscribers. You can get 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code BMF One Show at Manscaped.com. And I got to tell you guys, the craftsmanship and the details on this trimmer is exceptional. And really one of the best things about it is the wireless charging system that helps the battery last longer. And guys, we know in the F1 world, it's all about being as aerodynamically efficient and smooth as possible, not to mention comfortable when you're getting in the car. And Manscaped's Lawnmower 4.0 will help you do just that with its intelligent functionality and an incredible comfortable grooming experience. It really, really is something else. So go to manscaped.com and use the code BMF one show to get 20% off and unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. So thank you very much to the folks over at Manscaped. We're very excited for this new partnership. And of course, the podcast is also sponsored by our longtime sponsor now, the gpbox.com, which is the world's leading motorsport marketplace website. And guys, you should really check out their website at thegpbox.com because they've completely re-innovated their new site. It looks absolutely phenomenal. You can check out thegpbox.com. They can get used F1 car parts, F1 memorabilia, merchandise, and a whole host of other really cool motorsport merchandise. So check them out. You got discount code links found in the description below exclusively to our listeners as well. So check that out. All of those links can be found in the video description below or in the description of the podcast player below. All right. So now that we got that out of the way, I can bring in my fellow co-host Tyler McDonald joining me here on this beautiful Wednesday and hot sunny afternoon in Ottawa, Canada. Tyler, how are you today? Chris, uh, nice to be back after what was a spectacular Grand Prix. And uh, you just mentioned our newest sponsor. Um, well, they, they send us a nice little t-shirt as well. So I'm repping the Manscaped t-shirt for today's podcast. And let me tell you, Chris, the wet weather for the for the F1 cars, you know, we got to go in and change tires, uh, whether it's intermediates or wet. So Manscaped, don't worry, it's waterproof. So you don't even have to come in for a pit stop. You can just, <laughs> if it gets, starts getting wet out there, you can... Uh, you can uh, be a one-stop shop. So, no, really excited, and thank you to Manscaped for uh, all the cool stuff that they sent us, and we're really excited uh, about the partnership. And the 20% off and free shipping worldwide is awesome for everyone uh, because we have viewers all around the world as f one's such a global sport. Absolutely. Yeah, all that information is found in the description down below and also the pinned comment, so you can check that out now or if you would like after the show. And as you mentioned, man, I mean, this was such a chaotic race. And really stay tuned if you can for the entire episode here. If you are listening actually on an audio platform, I do recommend going to a video platform on YouTube as well because we're going to be showing a lot of interesting things that you might have missed while watching the race or even in the last couple of days. But I thought last year's 2020 Italian Grand Prix was going to be my favorite podium of all time. And until now it was, but this podium of Sergio Perez and Sebastian Vettel and Pierre Gasly is definitely now my all-time favorite podium. We got a whole litany of things that we have to get through, but let's just start with general race thoughts for you, Tyler. Oh, Chris, I don't know where to start. I mean, <laughs> Baku always delivers. And then that's the one thing I love about Azerbaijan. We haven't had a dull race here. I mean, um, you think of going back since this, this since the race started, it's always had an exciting twist to things. And it's it's such an interesting dynamic. And this is what I feel like we were missing last week with Monaco, is just that you have, yes, the street circuit, and you know, there's no room for error. And I love that about F1 because there shouldn't be any room for error. But at the same time, there's tons of overtaking opportunities, and, and we see tons of action, and they can race side by side. And that's another beautiful thing about Azerbaijan. It's almost one of the I'd say perfect, and maybe not nothing's perfect, but it's up there as the, the one of the best street courses in the world. Um, street courses, not pure racetracks, street courses. 
And uh, I, I think that it's proven its point now that it has to stay on the calendar forever uh, as one of those iconic tracks because everyone looks forward to it uh, no matter you know when it's coming up. Everyone wants to see the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. They for sure do. And really, except for 2016 and maybe the last race in 2019, which weren't as exciting, obviously, but you know, to get sort of a 50 or 75 percent strike rate in terms of an insane race is actually pretty good. And considering all the new tracks entering in the Formula One calendar as of late, Baku is kind of an underrated one. I mean, we always talk about how bad like the Sochi Autodrome is and those types of tracks, but Baku has actually, ever since it came onto the calendar, been really one of the best tracks to race on for, for modern F1. And even with the wide cars, like you mentioned, overtaking is possible. There's always crazy things happening. So I just really love this track. And even driving it on the F1 2020 game, it's difficult, but it's you can push and it's exciting. And it's just great characteristics. The city of Baku was absolutely beautiful. The backdrop's amazing. So yeah, f- sign that contract forever. <laughs> no, I think they should. I mean, I'm not sure when the current contract runs out. Um, but, you yeah, know, it, it's just such a phenomenal racetrack. I'd you know, there's only one thing I knew about Azerbaijan before uh, F1 went there. Or actually, there's two things. One, their flag is very cool. Uh, I like the color scheme of it. And two, Inter Baku was in like the Europa League, and I saw them like I watched them play on TV once. That's the only thing I knew about Azerbaijan. But uh, uh, as you know, since it's been there, uh, you know, I want to go visit Baku now, and yeah. that's kind of how F1, of course, wants to work with these cities. But I think it'd be a fantastic the landscape and the architecture in that city is beautiful. So. Um, definitely one of my stops that I would like to go to and probably check out a, a Grand Prix as well on there. Yeah, well done, Baku, as they usually say. And <laughs> this one was possibly one of the best ones in its short history. So I wanted to start off today's podcast with going over, I mean, there were so many drivers that you could kind of consider the star of the race. But for me, considering everything that's been happening in the past six months or so, Sergio Perez really had his day finally for Red Bull in Baku. I think Sergio Perez really deserves a lot of credit for this victory, and I'm so glad that he won this race because it silenced all of his critics that have been around since the start of this season, and also it solidified that Red Bull really did make the right choice in signing Sergio for the 2021 season. And, you know, I echo the same thoughts of Sebastian Vettel post-race, Feliz Navidad to Sergio Perez for <laughs> <laughs> for his second career victory. I think I think he needs to work on his Spanish lessons. I think he does, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, massive congratulations to Perez. And he drove a fantastic race. I mean, his lap one was absolutely stunning. And he really made up for his qualifying mistake passing those two fast cars right away on lap one, which put him right behind his teammate, Max Verstappen. And I'm curious to get your thoughts, Tyler, but in my opinion, not only did he seal the 2021 Azerbaijan Grand Prix victory and his first win for Red Bull, to me, he sealed his future with Red Bull Racing with that victory. I think Helmut Marko and Christian Horner should just re-sign him right away after this race. Uh, I think so too, Chris. And there was a point in that Grand Prix before Max crashed out during the pit stop cycle where I thought, Oh, geez, he has a chance of overtaking Max on the overcut here. And he almost did if it wasn't for that uh, the lengthy pit stop for, for Red Bull, which is unfortunate. But I mean, it happens, could happen to Max. And, um, you know, he had a real shot at, I thought they actually should have kept him out longer at, at first. I thought they should really try to overcut Max. But I, I know, obviously, with the championship in play, they probably didn't want to see Sturgio maybe do the overcut and have Max uh, upset. Um, but, he was flying out there all weekend. His lap one was phenomenal. He had a tough time during qualifying, but he made up all those positions on lap one and was in fourth place at the start uh, at the start of the race. So uh, awesome to see from Sergio. And you know, everyone was on him the first few races of the year, being, "Oh, he's not ready. He's not ready. He shouldn't." What a mistake this was. And what did we tell you here at the back markers F1 show? What did we tell you? We said, "Be patient. Sergio Perez is going to come into his own in a Red Bull car." because he's a fantastic driver and he's the right driver for that car. And look what's happened. He's, uh, he's done it. So awesome to see. And um, yeah, just awesome for Sergio because, you know, after such a long stint with, with uh, Force India and Racing Point, uh, you know, it's nice to see him get a well, win last year and now really, you know, solidify his career and his legacy of being you know, one of the best F1 drivers on the circuit right now. 
And with that victory as well, he became the only driver in this current hybrid era to win with two different constructors. Of course, like you just mentioned, Racing Point and Red Bull. And that's a pretty amazing statistic, really. I mean, obviously, it's been a Mercedes-dominated era. But for him to make this jump, and what's interesting, too, about this is, remember at the beginning, Perez said, I need five races in order to get on top of the RB16B. And he showed moments of brilliance, second race in Imola, qualifying second ahead of Max Verstappen. Even the first race in Bahrain with the troubles he had, cutting through the field to finish in the top five. So the results, they haven't been there in terms of podiums. But the strength of the race pace has been evident really since race number one. And now here we are, sixth race, right after he said it's going to take five races, wins that race. And it's not just, yes, he obviously got a little bit lucky, but even so, it would have been a clear one-two for Red Bull. He was doing a phenomenal job keeping Lewis Hamilton behind him, which is not easy to do. And I think that the Sky commentators were mentioning this, that he's not used to holding lewis hamilton a seven-time world champion behind him i mean sometimes it's happened in racing point when they're on different strategies but he's on some worn tires so it's usually just a quick overtake but he's not used to that pressure and he kept his head for 51 straight laps and had verstappen not crashed out would have done an excellent job being that rear gunner for max which is this was the first race and really which we shown you know bottas was not in contention and perez did a phenomenal job as a team player and also i just love the fact that Christian Horner was so happy post-race on the team radio. Helmut Marko was extreme, extremely excited uh, for Perez as well. So even though it was kind of, a, kind of a devastating day for Red Bull, Perez, as they said, you know, kind of finished it off for them. So it was just great to see that whole Red Bull family come together. I want to go just go back to that interesting stat you said about Perez being the only um, driver to win on with, with two different teams. Uh, did Vettel not win in, in 2014 with, that, with Red Bull? No. Oh, he didn't, eh? No, nope, it was just wow. Ricardo. It was just Ricardo. Okay, I didn't know that. I thought he had a, would have snuck out one. That's that's a wild stat on its own that yeah, he didn't win that year. So okay, very interesting. Good for Sergio. It was a. I had the exact same thought, but I, I re- went back and checked it, and nope. Uh, yeah, he didn't win any races. So Perez has wow. a very uh, unique record in in that regard as well. So. And I wanted to make another comment too, and obviously I think that it's pretty clear now that Perez was able to do something here at Red Bull that the likes of Albon and Gasly were not able to do. And we've said this many times before, with all due respect to those two drivers, they're very good, young, talented drivers, but they were thrown into a difficult system very early on in their careers. Perez is a seasoned Formula One veteran with, in my opinion, more skills and more talent than those two drivers. But Gasly and Albon, of course... I mean, in, and certainly in Gasly's case, has made a nice career for himself. And I think Albon will, will be doing it as well, too. And it was interesting to see the post. Uh, I don't know if you saw it, Tyler, on Instagram afterwards. Alex Albon was congratulating Sergio Perez for his victory. And then Perez reposted what Albon had said. And he even, he even added in his own comments that, like, you know, thanks very much. And that Albon is doing an exceptional job in his role as test and reserve driver. And that he's a very important part to this team as well. So it's just really kind of cool to see that uh, respect between the two of them. And just, again, Red Bull seems to be growing as a family and as a team together. And they're really kind of going on this championship charge as a team. And it doesn't seem to be any sort of hard feelings between Albon and Red Bull, which is nice to see. Oh, yeah, that's very true. And you can even see that between Max and Sergio throughout the season, how well they've been working together and talking. And like you see them, they're always talking about something. And um, that, that's awesome to see from Red Bull. I think that they need to have a full on every man back in the shop, uh, you know, in the garage and, um, and obviously in the race cars to be, uh, on board and on the same page if they want to tackle Mercedes and that, you know, it's showing how well they're doing right now in that case, because, um, they're, they're just, everything's going very well for them in terms of how well the car is going this year. The drivers are, 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 you know, with the car very well, especially Sergio now. And, um, their strategy has been pretty decent so far this year, except for a couple of blips here and there where you take a look at Mercedes and we've seen these kind of, interesting oh that that's not mercedes like and you know it's happened you know i'd say three four times this year well that's not what mercedes are used to doing you know take let's take the magic switch from for lewis this race well that doesn't usually happen for mercedes and you know it cost them uh cost lewis his first uh non-points finish in 56 races or something like that which is just a wild stat so it's interesting to see kind of a little shift that's going on between red bull and mercedes 
Very interesting indeed, and we're going to get to that magic button in just a couple of minutes' time and an explanation as to what that is, what it does, and why it led to Hamilton's mistake. But very interesting uh, result as we move on from Sergio Perez to the bigger championship picture and, of course, what was just such a devastating result for Max Verstappen. I think that all of us had a collective groan when we saw it, and funny enough, I kind of felt like something like that was coming after Lance Stroll's puncture. Because, you know, everything was going well, but it was still a long way to go, even though it happened with five laps to go. But it was just a long way to go, and you're just like, boy, I feel like something's going to happen here. And then they cut to that wide shot. It's Verstappen into the wall, and at that point, it was looking awful for the championship. What was your reaction when you saw Max going off in that tire failure? I think I yelled. I was like, oh! (laughs) (laughs) I couldn't believe it. it. It was just wild. I mean... Like you mentioned, I thought something would happen because of what strolls, what happened with strolls um, left rear, and I, I was interested to see what, okay, what's going to happen here because I, you know, after this that safety car, we saw some drivers go on to softs and and switch up their tires a little bit, um, but you know, I wasn't expecting it to be Max, and of course we saw this happen in a different case with when Valtteri from the lead crashed and blew a tire on the main straight he ran over debris so that's uh, a little bit different but you know that's this has happened in baku before um and now uh, it happens again and it's uh, what a scary shunt for both those drivers at 200 miles an hour going into those concrete barriers i mean you saw lance stroll's car lift up in the air a little bit there and, and for those of you who haven't watched indycar um when an open wheeler car lifts up like that it happens too much in indycar um and and gets into the catch fence uh we usually see some very horrific and life-threatening injuries um robert wickens for uh, you know canadian you know he's uh he's been paralyzed since and you know he we mentioned a story about him not too long ago he got to go back into a a car using hand controls and was able to race again which is awesome um we've seen some some fatal accidents as well with dan weldon in the car right so it's it's a very scary when owen wheelers lift up like that and luckily the you know, the innovation that F1 has that, that Stroll's car stayed on the ground and didn't go into that catch fence. Um, but yeah, a lot of talk has to be on those Pirelli tires because um, it, it, has the investigation started or have they said anything? I know they're talking how Lewis had a puncture and had a slit in, in one of his tires. Um, but they haven't mentioned anything about Max's or, um, or Stroll's car. And I know everyone was really thinking, well, same left tire. It's got to be Pirelli same with the whole downforce. They want to step softer this week than they did last year. Add back with their tire selection. Maybe that was a mistake from Pirelli. Um, maybe, like they mentioned, the heavier tires that they had to compensate for the amount of G forces those guys are pulling. Maybe it was just at its maximum load, and they didn't, you know, upgrade those tires enough to be able to handle those those downforce levels on the new F1 cars. So a lot of questions for Pirelli. Um, we saw what happened when this happened with Michelin. They weren't in the sport after. Um, now, probably, of course, it's different because they have a multi-year contract uh, and they've developed the new tires for next year. So they don't really have a choice other than to keep Pirelli. Uh, but it's something that's going to need to be uh, talking about with all the teams, Pirelli, the FIA, and uh, the driver should have a say in there as well on what they're feeling with the tires. They definitely have some explaining to do, and I think that they're saying that it's debris that caused the puncture. Of course, Verstappen disagrees with that because they didn't see any of the data or anything like that that would suggest that there was some sort of a debris. It's hard to tell, right, because it's kind of, you'd say, not a coincidence that it happened to two cars, both on the left rear and both similar type failures as well. So it didn't seem like there was problem with in terms of the construction of the tire that it was completely failing because they said it still had plenty of tread on it but as you mentioned you brought up a good point that hamilton's tire seemed to have some small cuts in it too so i'm not really sure let's it'll be interesting to see what the investigation holds i mean i remember i don't know if you remember in the race when verstappen cut the corner in turn 15 because mm-hmm. there was something on the track so maybe it was there when he picked it up but i can't remember exactly what set he was on so that was, I remember what you're talking about. That was a tree branch that, uh, that fell going into turn 15. And it was actually Lewis that hit it. And it uh, created a, not a hole, but a, a very big indent uh, on his front wing. And they had to replace the front. That's why they replaced the front wing uh, during the red flag. Um, but I don't think a tree branch would 
do that to a a tire. I don't know because he he wouldn't have hit it um, because yeah. he like he obviously missed that tree branch and Lewis hit it. So um, no, that, that, that's the only thing I can think of as well. But who knows how? I don't know how dirty that track was. I don't know what de- debris was left from Stroll's car, um, and I don't know what debris caused Stroll's accident. Right. So uh, there's lots of figuring out to do. It is a street circuit. Yeah, you're right. A ton of stuff blows onto the track throughout the weekend, so it could have been everything. Debris is certainly a possibility, but I think that there's going to be a lot of answers from Pirelli because this was an ex- especially dangerous situation, and we're actually going to get to that next because I think the FIA and the race directors, uh, they're very lucky that we didn't see something even more catastrophic this weekend. I've got a bone to pick. Okay, great. I've got a, I've got a bone to pick. I, I think here. we have the same one then, and I've got a, a great video for to accompany that too. Um, so we can go to that now. I just wanted to kind of show you some of the re- reaction on the race from uh, you know Dutch TV, which was <laughs> you know obviously uh, they've always got some great commentators, but uh, they were incredibly devastated, and I think that their okay. reaction kind of was most fans' reactions, maybe unless if you're a Hamilton fan. Um, so let's just have a listen here. So this was with five laps to go coming across the line. Crazy. Oh, no! 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 Weg Weer een klapband. Oei, oei, oei. Daar gaat je overwinning. Yep. First- that was pretty much my reaction too. I was like, yeah. no. Oh. <laughs> uh, this was, we'll get to that one later. <laughs> this was a funny one. This Marshall definitely is getting fired. Uh, he's not coming back to the next race here in Baku. <laughs> Just photo op time. Oh, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's phenomenal. I guess he didn't realize that there's um, F1 the, TV still has all that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's. Uh, I doubt he'll be back. And same with the guy who took the photo. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the team was not happy. I mean, you're probably not going to damage the car sitting there, but I mean, you always see the drivers being careful where they get in. So yeah, the team probably wasn't going to be uh, happy with that. Uh, so that was oh, that was the wrong one. That we're going to get to that one next. Sorry, I just got to wait till this moves away. So okay, so this was what I wanted to show everybody. And Tyler, I think you're probably going to have the same uh, bone to pick with the FIA and the race stewards as I do. Um, So I'm just going to move this video forward just a little bit here. Uh, Because the first couple of ones, you can't see it that well. Okay, we'll we'll start roughly from there. So my, my problem here was, if you go back to the Stroll incident, right, where he crashed, and you heard on Stroll's radio as well, he was calling for the red flag immediately. The reason why was because cars were coming in full throttle over 300 kph and he did not want an you know an alex zanardi or antoine hubert type crash of another car t-boning him right so he was calling for something in the safety car i mean it was deployed fairly quickly from what i remember but in this accident i don't know what the hell they were doing and why it took them so long to deploy the safety car i mean it, i would say it was almost a minute that it took them to deploy a safety car, and they just had double wave yellows. And five you know, more laps. Five more laps. I'll just lower the volume a little bit here. You can see in this video just how quickly the drivers were coming by. And at this point, there was double wave yellows, so drivers are supposed to lift off. But as you'll see, a lot of them don't because, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And Leclerc is going to make some similar comments here as well. But I mean, just look at the the entry speed here, and it's not just Max's car, but the debris as well on the track. <laughs> He's like, stay left, go right. <laughs> we are still racing. Yeah, like. That's a joke, that's a joke. Put the fucking safety car out straight away. Why are they, why are they waiting? Yeah, good question, Charles. Yeah, very good um, And I just wanted to skip ahead because there was some that was like really... Because it was the thing is, is when you got past, like, let's say the top five and the top six, they had much more time to already know that Verstappen Careful had crashed. On the right you, side. Norris Verstappen was the one who the lifted the most. Yeah, Norris clearly lifted. Double yellow flags, double yellow flags. And at some points, too, you could see the green flag even. So this was science. 
Yeah, because they would have the green flag after the double yellows. It's the next sector, right? Yeah. yeah. Stay on the left. Stay to the left. So there's a big lift from oh. signs. Yeah, he lifted really nice. So you there. see the green. Look, if you look at the top right, you see the green. Yeah. So that's because well, that's the sector after section yeah. after the. So it's all good after that. You can race after that, which is wild. And I think Max was getting out of his car as these cars oh, yeah. were coming by. Insane. Racing cars in front. Watch for Ricardo behind. Use K1. I think Science made some similar comments too. Let's come on, that's safety car. Yep. And then I think the last one I wanted to show here was the Alfa Romeo, I believe. So okay, same. So this is Alonso. Another car went off. Stay on the left on the star grid. There's some debris. Not much of a lift. Oh, there it is, a little. Oh, there it is. When he probably saw it, I was like, "What the heck?" Yellow, where you are now. Yellow, where you are. Yeah, I think Alonso had some radio too, asking why, um, why they didn't safety car it right away. That was Renault it? engine sounds so weird. Yeah, it really does, eh? It is very dangerous in that position, the debris. We need safety car. Yeah, so you see, he's in the yeah. castle section, no safety car. But look at Raikkonen, too. Okay, your safety car window is closed. Safety car window is closed. You see, he was slipstreaming the car in front, so he was going even Stay faster. On the left. Stay yeah. On the left. There is a Red Bull on the right. And yellow head, yellow head. And look, he foot to the floor, no lift whatsoever. Yeah, he did not lift at all. Okay, yellow, you out. <laughs> Crazy. So yeah, that I'm, that was just really the the gist of uh, of that, and I wanted to show that to people because we didn't obviously we didn't see that on the on you know the main feed as we're watching, but it was really circulating the internet afterwards because as the drivers you saw it in that radio, but fans questioning as well. I mean, what were the FIA doing? And what's interesting is that. Uh, Michael Massey, I believe, right, is the race director. Yeah. Um, you know, he got that radio from McLaren after McLaren was saying, oh, S uh, Sonoda should be penalized. And he said, well, you know what? I think every driver on the grid should be penalized. Well, why didn't he do it? Why don't you just penalize the whole grid? Like, like I, I think he, sh he should have just penalized the whole grid at that point. Like, just send a message. Because um, at that point, like, he, oh, I'll bring up the next driver's meeting. Okay, well, no, no, no. Like, let's, let's make a point of it now. <laughs> And then you can also bring it up at the next driver's meeting. Um, for me, I'm going I'm to use a, a Fernando Alonso quote. For me, this should be red flag. For me, this is red flag. <laughs> uh, from his famous, uh, famous oh, I forget what race that was from. Um, but I think that it should have been automatic. I know we try not to stay from these red flags. The Stroll incident should have been a red flag. And the Verstappen incident should have been a red flag right away. And the reason I think of this, and you can disagree with me, Chris, or, or any of the viewers, is that we saw what happened to Antoine Hubert. Uh, we saw that, you know, that very scary and, and unfortunate incident at, um, that took his life and how, you know, it's a split second decisions on where a car can, can enter the back on the track. And, uh, you know, Eau Rouge is such a, a blind and very fast uh, turn and in, in part of, of, of Spa, right? So uh, at Baku, you're going through those curves as well, and you're flat out through those those first S's before you get to the, the long straight. Um, and that's where Stroll's car was, uh, very blind as well. And, you know, Max was at the end of the straight, but, you know, at the same time, you're still going 300 kilometers an hour down, uh, down that straight. So for me, I, I think that it should have been red flagged right away. Um, and that shows you a message that, okay, this is a very dangerous part of the track for the driver, even though there might not be a, a serious injury at the time, you know, we need to prevent a serious injury, uh, from happening. And we could have cars ran over the, run over the debris and blow a tire themselves and crash into Verstappen or, or crash into stroll. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, and if you saw during the stroll video on how much he was fighting the car to steer it back toward the walls so that he wouldn't go in the middle of the track as he knew. And that's why he yelled red flag, red flag right away, because he knew if he goes in the middle of the track, you know, he's in very serious danger. So 
Um, I, that needs to be reviewed by the FIA, in my opinion, on how they, you know, procure and how they go through those scenarios of drivers in vulnerable positions in very high speed straightaways or parts of the track uh, that are, are left in a vulnerable position. Cause you know, a red flag's whatever red flags, red flag, you'd rather red flag it than have um, a graver situation on your hands. Yeah. So at the very least, I think safety car would have been immediate or should have been immediate. And then like you mentioned, red flag, which they eventually did, but it just took them two, almost three minutes to put it out there. So they were very lucky that nothing serious happened to Max Verstappen, to any of the other drivers. I mean, Max was climbing out of the car at that point, and all these cars are still zooming past him. And you also have that dangerous pit entry wall, too, that, of course, ties into the tire conversation with failures and how dangerous that could have been. So more review needs to go into that. It's just some clumsy things have been happening with the FIA and the race directors as of late. I just don't know why they why it took so long for them to react in that case. And with the double wave yellows, I mean, drivers are supposed to lift, but we know these guys are racing drivers. It's five laps to go. Everybody's pushing. So it's very hard for them to lift. If you put a VSC out at the minimum, at least the drivers have to slow down to a certain delta that's on their steering wheel. So at least you can minimize some risk there. And then obviously with the safety car, they slow down completely. So again, I just don't understand. We saw where the incident was right away. They've got way more data and information and they put so much money into all this. And yet it took them, you know, like five minutes to react to it, which was just absolutely insane. So hopefully the drivers will will bring that up, obviously, in the next meeting and, and something to, to be changed, because I think we avoided a big one. I think so as well. I think we got lucky there and hopefully it's a lesson learned uh, for the FIA. And we can see this corrected in, in races down the line um, because, you know, we all don't want to see a, a scary incident happen in, in Formula One or in any of the any of, of the racing sports. Right. Um, it, it happens too often as it is. So, uh, I mean, NASCAR has done a fantastic job in their safety precautions. Now they haven't had a, a, a death since uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr. in 2001. I mean, that's almost 20 years. That's unheard of in motorsports for, for one organization to not have any deaths. Um, and that's in all three national series as well. So, I mean, they've done the fantastic job over at uh, NASCAR. IndyCar has a lot of improvement that they need to do. And, uh, and so does Formula One. They have a lot of improvement that they need to do as well on their safety, safety sequences. It's gone a long way, but uh, of course, there's always room for improvement. For sure. Absolutely. And so obviously that puncture really seemed to have turned the championship on its head until we got to the red flag restart and then it got completely reversed the other way back on its head. But it's still going to be a big race in terms of the championship picture, depending on how this all ends. But uh, I will admit, (laughs) I will be honest here to say that when I saw that Hamilton was in second and then with a chance to win the race, I was like, I cannot believe this guy's luck. I mean, honestly, I mean, we talked about this before. He's a great driver, one of the greatest ever, but his luck is quite incredible. I mean, just go back to the race in Imola, right? And that was going through my mind. I'm just like, I can't believe how lucky this guy is. I mean, Verstappen was about to take a 15 or so point lead in the championship, comfortable victory, and then boom, something like this happens. Now Hamilton's going to end up taking a 20 point swing in his favor after this race. And so at the time, I'm like, you know what? They should just end this race under the safety car. <laughs> <laughs> let, let Sergio Perez win it. Come on, end this under the safety car. And it was funny because Red Bull actually called for the red flag, which was smart on them so that teams could change it to fresher tires. So uh, That was good. a really good call. Exactly, yeah. At least somebody had their head on their shoulders in terms of safety. But now that I saw afterwards the red flag restart, I was like, good decision. <laughs> 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 Excellent choice to restart the race. And I, we have to play this video because I, I've watched this video probably 15 times since it got released, and it makes me laugh every single time. I'm not sure if you saw it, um, but it was Mark Weber's reaction oh. to to the the red flag restart, and it pretty much just sums up the whole of F1 World's reaction. This is brilliant. Lights out, and Perez immediately jumps across. Lewis Hamilton's going to get the lead. Lewis Hamilton takes it away, but he lands over, and he's lost it. <laughs> Lights out, and Perez immediately jumps across. Lewis Hamilton's going to get the lead. Lewis Hamilton takes it away, but he lands over, and he's lost it. Phenomenal. Oh, <laughs> How great is that? It is funny watching uh, Weber's reaction in the beginning and the whole team as well. Like, they're like, oh, like Perez is going to get passed. And then it's just like out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, that was brilliant. I like, I don't know who the guy is in the background. He's slapping, but he is just laughing. It's kind of, 
I mean, probably should be laughing as a professional broadcaster, but I mean, that's pretty funny. I mean, that is a reaction like that. Yeah, I love seeing that genuine reaction. And man, what a mistake from, from Lewis Hamilton, something that we really don't see often. And we only learned after the race that we thought it was just a, a mistake. That And what's funny, too, is that if you heard the team radio when they were about to go onto the red flag, you know, Lewis is like, guys, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Yeah. And, and even Toto was like, completely agree, Lewis. And then that was, it was a really just, good Toto. Oh, impression. thank you. I've been working on it a little bit. so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was just so funny. Cause you, you could kind of like sp- play that SpongeBob, you know, five minutes later uh, type thing. And then he's just sending it into turn one. So we all thought that, oh, like he just overcooked it trying to win the race. But it was actually a, he hit a switch on the steering wheel um, the brake magic switch that eventually was the reason why he went wide. Now, I've seen a couple people post videos about uh, what that means and what the button does. So if you guys seen that already, maybe this is uh, old news to you. But for people who don't know what that brake magic button is, is essentially what it's used for is, especially on safety car restarts, you can lose it, use it on the laps going to the grid, formation lap, uh, quali- or pre-qualifying lap. But mainly it's used for these types of scenarios on the formation lap or safety car restarts. And what it does is basically moves the brake balance all the way to the front in order to generate front tire and brake temperature. So what it does is it basically turns off the rear brakes in essence, and it also limits the harvesting of the MGUK, which is obviously connected in with the rear brake system with the new hybrid uh, components we've had the last couple of years. And so what it does is that it enables the driver to put heat all the way through the brake disc and also the brake pads as well, which then goes into the tire. So the reason why you saw Hamilton's tires smoking on the on the formation lap and when he was sitting there on the grid was because he did a good job in heating up the, the front tires and the brakes. Uh, but maybe it was just a little bit too much of a good job because they were almost about to catch fire. Luckily, the lights went out quickly. But you can see this here. Somebody did a nice little uh, superimpose here on Hamilton's steering wheel. So on the left, you see the lap before uh, the red flag restart in normal racing conditions. His brake balance is around 51%, which is it's usually between 50 to 60% in normal racing conditions. Now, also understand that a change of, let's say, 2 to 5% of brake bias is pretty large. But his on with the brake magic on was 86.5% to the front which is just absolutely ridiculous. And what it does is it basically means you don't have any rear brakes. All the pressure is on the fronts. So a lockup is just easily inevitable. But 86.5% is absolutely insane. And uh, he absolutely accidentally hit it on an upshift. Uh, because I don't know if, he, if, Tyler, you noticed it too. When he starts the race, he usually holds his hand on top of his steering wheel when he lets go of the clutch. And I guess apparently that's when he bumped it at some point when he kind of swerved over to the other side to kind of avoid Perez. Yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. I listened to the full three minute radio of, of the start going to the grid and, and everything like that. And after the race, and um, it was interesting to me because he was all confused because he said, I, I swear it turned off. And that's when they said, no, you hit it on an upshift and, um, and everything like that. But um, it's crazy how something little like that, I wonder what's going to happen in the driver's um debrief with them if maybe they move that break that brake magic switch to a different spot on the steering wheel because of this mistake that happened and um it, it will be really interesting to see what happens uh, down the line with his with his steering wheel yeah maybe they will change it it's funny that it just happened because it, obviously it hasn't happened before and it was just an accidental hit so but we know it can happen because they're so tight in the cockpit and the buttons are all close together so they might need to rearrange the setup of that button or maybe some sort of a confirmation button uh, when you want to engage it but yeah it just completely overrides everything else in terms of the normal brake balance toggles that the drivers can use it overrides everything and actually we have this video we showed this last year in the secure grand prix when george russell obviously filled in for lewis hamilton for Mercedes and Russell obviously being a new driver for the team he w- he didn't know this brake magic system and maybe it's different in the Williams but this is kind of a nice little video as a reminder just to show sort of what the the button does and how it is used so you can see in the bottom left the brake magic is on he's in mode one so recharging the battery And you can see he's about to cancel the magic here, if you pay attention to the left-hand side. And if you need it, you can 
Let's imagine go strat one uh, if you want to get rear brake attempts. So he's about to turn it off here. Into a window. To see, yeah. Front, so that's what Lewis did <laughs> um, <laughs> eventually, uh, but then obviously hit it accidentally as well. And from what I understand from that, canceling. So you heard in the radio there, Bono telling uh, George Russell there that front brake temps were just a little bit too much. You know, they were in a good window. So he turned off that brake warming magic to take the balance off of the front and move it more towards the rear so that he can get uh, more temperature into the rears and obviously putting into that recharge mode then engages the MGUK and the brake by wire system on the rear. So then he's able to evenly distribute brake heat that way. So it's very interesting. I'm curious. I'm sure all the other teams have a similar setting like that. Because, like, for example, if you're playing the F1 2020 game, you could do that manually by just moving the brake bias all the way to the front. But it you have to go, you know, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60 percent. So it's really <laughs> hard to do. So this is just kind of a shortcut button that has a bunch of presets, which overrides the rest of the systems of the car. But then obviously it's an issue when you accidentally hit it like that. So, wow. I mean, what a, what a crazy end to that race and that little mini Grand Prix and now the championship is still intact from after Monaco. No points gained, obviously, but we'll see at the end of the year what will be the deciding factor when we look back on Baku, how big of a moment this will be. Yeah, we will. Uh, and it kind of works because it, it nulls. The, it keeps everything level where it was before the race. So it's like, okay, we're, we're good in that scenario. Um, because it, it kind of felt bad that Max would lose points on such a bad scenario that wasn't his fault. And um in this case, kind of Lewis said, I guess, the same way. So um, it's nice that it, it evened out there, but who knows how this is going to, I mean, if it could go, any, you could put scenarios, that, you know, what if this happened and then this happened and blah, 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 and, and try to come up with a solution. But um, when we look back on after 23 races or 22, whatever it's going to be, um, we'll have to see how this plays out. Yeah, for sure. Such a, I don't know if we've ever seen a race like that in which the two championship contenders kind of have moments like that so very very dramatic stuff and as you mentioned a couple of uh, minutes ago Tyler I believe yeah it was around like 54 55 races since Lewis Hamilton's last non points finish and I believe actually it was going back to something crazy like 2009 it was his worst finish that wasn't as a result of some mechanical failure because he was down in 15th even behind the two Hasses. yeah and it was actually Mercedes's worst finish outside of the points uh, since US wow. 2012. Obviously, they've had double DNFs before, but in terms of when they finished a race, this was their worst result since 2012. So I very... just want to uh, give a quick shout out, Chris, to Nikita Mazepin, who <laughs> beat Lewis Hamilton on track. The GOAT. In an F1 race. So that's impressive. Good for Nikita. Yeah, we're going to get to him too because yeah, he... he almost killed his teammate. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a couple more points here uh, before we wrap up today's episode. And obviously, Sebastian Vettel, what a drive. And mm. he's got his mojo back. He's happy. He's energetic. He's extremely motivated. And he just had a brilliant drive, man. And considering the last couple of years struggling with wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat, he was one of the drivers with Perez included and Gasly who just put his car in all the right places when it mattered the most. And starting in P11 was actually a blessing in disguise for him because he got the free tire choice, he went long on the first stint, and then everything after that just nailed it exceptionally well. First podium for Aston Martin F1 as well. So just so great to see Vettel was reading, uh, leading the race and also on the podium as well. So confirming that Monaco pace and possibly a turning point, obviously still dependent on the limitations of the AMR 21. But nonetheless, I mean, just what a race, what a race for him. You know, phenomenal. The whole race uh, for Aston Martin is going really well too with Stroll strategy, uh, putting him on hearts to start the race. Uh, and you know, unfortunately, of course, there's a tire failure, but he was, would have been on for some really good points as well. Uh, but just really, really smooth and calm from Sebastian Vettel all weekend, and um, it kind of worked out how his uh, qualifying 11th, uh, you know, he was he was two hundredths or whatever it was off. Uh, worked in his favor because he had an extra set of brand new soft tires uh, for the uh, for the restart, I guess, or the the, the red flag restart. Um, and I thought, honestly, I thought he was going to win the race. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I was very, I was like, Vettel's going to win this race. 
And I was so pumped for him. I was hoping he would do it. Uh, also just couldn't catch Perez. Perez was was phenomenal in that restart. Um, but it, the whole weekend, I thought Sebastian Vettel um, really started to grow into that car. Uh, it is getting to getting very used to that new Aston Martin car. Um, just I like I like to see Vettel up front, and after the hardship he had last year and the struggles he had, it was awesome to see him on the podium. Um, and just you know. He could tell that a little cel- like he had just had that, an awesome celebration and know how much it meant to Aston Martin and um, awesome stuff to see. And we should also note too, going back to our initial discussion on Sergio Perez, Vettel almost did actually win the race because Perez had to stop yeah. the car in the pit lane because he was having almost almost had a hydraulics failure. If that lap, if that race would have lasted another lap or two, Perez would have DNF'd as well. So <laughs> Sebastian Vettel was very close to winning that race with Aston Martin. But at one point, I'm like, he's going to catch Hamilton. He's going to pass Hamilton too. And then obviously all the drama happened as well. But yeah, I echo the same thoughts. Just great to see him back. And, and obviously he's been much happier this year. And with the exception of the first two races of the year, he's actually been solid this year. Mm-hmm. and more at home in that car than he was with Ferrari. So it's only onwards and upwards for, for Vettel and Aston Martin here. And Stroll, too. I mean, obviously had a, a devastating failure, but was on for a points finish, and he's had a, a solid year as well. So their focus is on 2022, and hopefully they don't compromise that car by trying to upgrade this one too much. Uh, but that battle for fifth is now going to be very interesting with the other team that was on the podium with them, and that's Alpha Tauri and Pierre Gasly. And Gasly's just continues to stun us and impress us year after year since being demoted from Red Bull, of course, with his really big successes of last year, but continued that with this year. His last lap overtake on Charles Mm -hmm. Leclerc was just phenomenal, and the way he defended going into turn three and turn four, and this whole podium was just all about redemption. I mean, all three of these drivers, former or current Red Bull drivers, all three being dropped by their former teams, coming back to be back on the podium, and Gasly is just probably the best example of that phrase redemption and he was just absolutely on it all weekend long he really was and he just seems such like so at home in that alpha tari that um you know he can make magic with with that car that really shouldn't be up there but he always has that car up there uh it's really impressive to see how he does it so i mean we saw how much he struggled in the the big sister red bull car i just wonder if he just knows that alpha alpha tari so well that he's so comfortable that he knows what he can get out of it. Um, you saw how Perez was like that with with Force India and Racing Point back uh, the last few years as well. So familiarity with the car, I think, plays a huge factor, but he's just come out with such determination. And it's awesome to see him do well because he has some of the best reactions on the grid uh, when he's doing well. Uh, you have to think of, like, of course, when he won, the, oh my God, what did we just do? Um, I- iconic kind of celebration there and just another fantastic weekend for for Pierre and I wonder where this is going to go in the future for him I mean does a big team try to sign him uh, who knows there's so many seats who are, you know I could see him eventually going to uh, Alpine down the line if, if they have their car in the right scenario but I mean right now I'd probably stay or want to stay with AlphaTauri where he is so interesting seat from from Pierre Gasly it is a tricky scenario for him because it's difficult to see him going back to Red Bull now, obviously with Perez in that seat. And then you look at the rest of the grid and you go, okay, yeah, Alpine's always been an option, but I think Alpine will probably want to stick with the two guys that they have now because we're going to talk about uh, Fernando Alonso in, in this next portion here and his uh, phenomenal race too. So it, it's curious to see where he'll end up because he is driving so well. And like you said, he's just gelling with Alpha Tauri. And the guys have so much confidence in his ability. And you just know that in that scenario, they don't have to worry so much as they do with Yuki Sonoda that, okay, like one of the things that makes Sonoda so great is the fact that he pushes the limits, but that also makes you clench up a little bit because you you don't know when he's going to crash, right? Obviously with his incident in Q3. So he's a little bit too fiery, obviously being an F1 rookie. But with Gasly, you know everything's under control and he's going to deliver for you when it matters the most. So... Right now, I think Alpha Tower is his home. I'm curious to see where he'll end up, but he's got chances like this to bag these podiums. And every time Lewis Hamilton seems to make some sort of mistake, there's Gasly finishing on the podium, like Brazil 2019, Italy last year. So very good job from from Pierre Gasly and Sonoto as well to, to finish P7, his best 
result in Formula One to date. So a good weekend altogether for Alpha Tauri and important as well, considering Vettel and Aston Martin's P2. So that's big for them in the constructor standings. And then behind them in the constructors is Alpine sitting in seventh place. And really what flew under the radar was Fernando Alonso finishing in P6. And it was kind of a tough weekend for Alpine. Of course, Ocon retired with an issue early in the race, but the pace of the car just wasn't really there. But Fernando Alonso, much like Sebastian Vettel, using that wise old head, that world championship experience. And we got to show this here because, again, this is another example of what wasn't shown on the broadcast because of the crazy finish. But Fernando Alonso really got his P6 done and dusted here on the safety car restart. P10 to P6. This was just an absolute phenomenal, phenomenal effort here from Alonso to, uh, to score his best finish since coming back to F1. Last car is on the grid. The lights went out really quickly on that restart too. Yeah, they did. So you can see him coming here, picks off Carlos Sainz. He picked off Ricardo there as well, and Hamilton, I believe, obviously. Oh yeah, true, yeah. So I believe that's Lando Norris was ahead. He was trying to get past Leclerc because <laughs> Leclerc almost took nice out job, Gasly oh, and uh, Vettel. <laughs> that's right. I can't get over that sound of that uh, Renault engine. Yeah, yeah. Man, it sounds weird. He almost made a move there. Look at this was a this was probably that's one of the moves of the race. Phenomenal move on the outside. It's that's such a hard place to yeah. Wow. And then smart defense going on the inside line here because you got the wall on the outside. Yeah, just really, really, really nice stuff from Fernando there. Just really good car placement, right? Like uh, he knew where to put his car in the right scenario and take advantage of other people's mistakes. And like you mentioned, that overtake on Sonoda was just beautiful on the outside. <laughs> Yeah, just keeping that wise old head and in certain places too, in those slow speed corners, not easy to overtake, but he was really aggressive and it paid off in the end because obviously he made up four places, uh, you know, three on track technically with Hamilton going wide, but it was good for Alonso and on the post-race radio as well, just super positive to the team telling them, you know, this is for you guys. This is because of all the hard work that we've done. And he said coming into this weekend that the Azerbaijan was sort of the start of another season for him. Pretty good start then to, to this yeah. new season, but it was kind of uh, not that Alonso wasn't negative or uh, positive before, but you know Fernando, he's always wanting for more and wanting to push the team for more. But he was very positive, a lot of positive reinforcement. So it's good, good to see from from him and Alpine. And as we see now with Perez and with Vettel, after the five race mark, these new drivers and new teams are really starting to get the hang of their new cars. So. I think uh, buckle up for the next couple of races because I think we'll see these guys really coming into their own at these new teams. Yeah, I would agree as well, Chris. I mean, Ricardo had a, a, a pretty solid race for himself as well. So uh, the other driver that we've been talking about trying to learn his new car. So uh, no, good for Ricardo as well. All right, then finally to end this episode and what was a actually a good weekend for Haas because it moved them up to P... Uh, nine in the constructor standings ahead of Williams <laughs> because of their finish uh, in 13th for Mick Schumacher and 14th for Nikita Mazepin. But unfortunately, it doesn't go without any drama. So yeah, we were about to give Nikita Mazepin driver of the day honors for finishing ahead of Lewis Hamilton, but then he goes and do does probably one of his stupidest moves so far in F1 and quite frankly, most dangerous as well. And this was on the last lap too. Uh, you know, he was having some issues with his ERS uh, energy system. The battery was draining too much, but I just don't know what he was thinking in this scenario. And, like, M Mick is a very quiet, polite guy, but listen to how pissed he was. What the fuck was that, honestly? Seriously? Does he want to kill us? Understood, Mick, understood. Checkered flag, checkered flag. I mean, he... You can see Mick was, was giving him the business as he was past him going 200 miles an hour, <laughs> yeah. which shows you how pissed off he was because he wasn't even watching the road. He was watching Mazepin giving him crap. So 
a terrible move by Mazepin. I mean, we've seen how cars can over, you know, it, it, it can go on top and, and Mick would have gone for a really, really scary ride up, up in the air. So, um, you can't do that move, especially on your teammate. I mean, I don't know what you're thinking. So uh, terrible for Mazepin. Hopefully, ha sit down with him and give him a good talking to to figure it out. It always just seems like one step forward for him after Monaco, and then mm. three steps back. You know, it's just like that's the problem, right? Is we don't want to always be hating on one particular driver, but when you're doing stupid stuff like that, I just I don't understand what was the point of that. You're gonna lose the position anyway. Slipstream and Baku so powerful what difference does it make really that much is like yeah. you said it's your teammate it's yeah when you, when you upset Mick Schumacher that much to where he's swearing and dropping f bombs then you know you messed up <laughs> oh for sure for sure Mick's a cool calm collected guy and he was livid as he should have been yeah absolutely all right well do you have anything else then from the 2021 Azerbaijan Grand Prix uh, no, it's just uh, it's interesting how we're going from you know tight Baku to now the maybe most wide open track out there in Paul Ricard and Yay. France. <laughs> so um, hopefully, hopefully France delivers. It's been underwhelming really since we've been there, um, but we'll, we'll see. It will be an interesting race, I'm sure. All right, Whew, now we can exhale after <laughs> what was a crazy race, but it's why we love Formula One. This was just fantastic on every single level, and no matter who you're a fan of, obviously it was devastating for the Orange Army and, of course, Team LH, but nonetheless, we saw some great drives and some excellent performances, so hopefully that can carry on now for the rest of the season. Tyler, thanks very much for your input. Uh, we're coming up, I think, to the French Grand Prix in a couple weeks' time. And, yeah, we'll definitely connect for that and uh, hopefully continue on this excellent racing. Hopefully uh, we'll have a good race in France. Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about France. Um, it always looks nice with the paint on the lines uh, that they have <laughs> on the track, but so hopefully it leads to a nice race this time. Yeah, I hope so, too. All right. Thanks again, Tyler. We appreciate you very much on the Backmarkers F1 Show podcast. We're, of course, going to catch up with Shaker after the French Grand Prix. We'd like to thank everybody for listening or watching today's episode. We really appreciate the support. Of course, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Subscribe also on the audio podcast platform so you never miss a new episode from us after the races. And we've got all of our social links that can be found in the description below on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And, of course, the donation links if you'd like to support our channel. I'd just like to give another quick thanks to all of our sponsors, the GP Box and Manscaped.com for supporting the Backmarkers F1 show. We really appreciate it, and we really appreciate you guys. We couldn't be doing this without your support. Thanks again, and until next time, it's bye for now. See you guys. <laughs>